All right, we're good. Cool. Hey, um, so uh, really happy to have Max Bennett here uh, talking to us about himself and his and the new paper he just published uh, uh, that extends uh, some of the work we've done and takes it into uh, some new areas. So I'll let him talk about it. Cool. So let me share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. Yes. Yes. So a uh, little background on me. Uh, my day job has nothing to do with neuroscience whatsoever. Um, I uh, started a company called Blue Core eight years ago, um, which does personalization uh, for retailers. So we apply machine learning to um, help companies like Nike or Under Armour make personalization decisions on their websites. Uh, so all the product recommendations you see, uh, all the emails you get from brands like that, we are powering a lot of the decisioning behind that. It's been a crazy eight years. Uh, we're now about 240 employees on three continents. Uh, about a third of the top 100 retailers in the US use our products. Um, so it's been very, very fun uh, working on the entrepreneurial stuff. Uh, two years ago, um, just out of intellectual interest, uh, I stumbled on Jeff, your 2009 paper, and then your folks' 2016 paper. Um, and I just kind of became very inspired by the approach um, which was sort of trying to decipher the underlying computational roles or algorithms based on the observed biological circuitry. So my passion project for the last two years has simply been working on this, reading a ton, um, and then someone sort of challenged me to take some of the ideas I was working on and try and publish it. Um, so that's sort of the history. I, I, it's not my, my background by any means, but uh, it is something I'm very interested in. Um, so I'm very excited to be here. I'm humbled to be here. Um, very open to feedback and thoughts, and hopefully some of these ideas will be interesting or, or useful. So, had you done any any neuroscience reading before? What, what year would the two years ago? Nope, it's all been two years of. You've read a lot in, in the last <laughs> two years, so it's, uh, it's, it's impressive. You know, the, the, all the references and the, uh, how much you have picked up. It's, uh, really Thanks. Well, I was inspired to see, you know, I think there's a lot of people that feel boundaries that uh, you need some sort of degrees to do things. And, you know, people who pave the path of doing this without those degrees make it easier for people like me to feel safe and like I can do it. So appreciate that. Cool. Should we dive in? Yep. That'd be great. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to try and keep the motivation uh, short. I'll keep it less than 60 seconds. I'll mostly do it for people watching on YouTube. I assume I'm going to be preaching to the choir on a lot of the motivation stuff. So I'll try and skip past it as fast as I can. Um, so high level, the brain can do a bunch of things that people have not figured out how to do uh, in state-of-the-art machine learning. Um, the five that are particularly interesting to me, um, online or continuous learning, uh, you know, the brain is clearly far superior at that than any of the state-of-the-art algorithms, far better at generalization. One-shot learning is something that we're way better at than state-of-the-art vision algorithms or any alternatives. Sensory motor learning, uh, we still don't have robots that can do the dishes. Uh, that's too complex a task, which is kind of silly. There's clearly amazing um, sort of economic benefits we would get if we could even just have robots that would do tasks like that. And then efficiency, obviously the brain works on the, the energy uh, of a light bulb. So in, in terms of trying to understand what the brain's doing, obviously there's a lot of interest in doing that. The neocortex is where I would say like 90% of the sort of smart brains are working on and it makes sense why, because uh, it seems to be where all the interesting stuff happens. So uh, my paper is similar to what you folks are working on, trying to decipher what is the uh, neocortex doing. Um, obviously in uh, 1978, Vernon Mountcastle came up with this great idea over the last 40 years, there's been a lot of support for this idea, which is there seems to be a repetition of the same canonical microcircuit. And the reason this is, you know, such an exciting concept, at least this is true in sensory cortex. There's some debate over frontal cortex. There's certain different neural types and all that stuff, which we'll not talk about here. But the reason you know, so I don't think there's a single statement in neuroscience that's not controversial. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> agree. You know, almost agreed. everything is con con seems to be controversial. Totally, in totally. <laughs> You're absolutely right. <laughs> um, but I, I would say frontal cortex seems to be more controversial. Like I'm very aware of neuron types like von Economo neurons that are present in frontal cortex that aren't present in sensory cortex. There are no portions of sensory cortex that are missing layer four. There are lots of eight granularities of frontal cortex. But yes, th there are people that disagree that even there is a canonical microcircuit. Well, that, you know, that doesn't mean that Mountcastle is wrong. It, it just means right. that there's variations on a the theme. And I think even thus people like ourselves who are big fans of, of Mount Castle's idea will admit that there are variations on a theme, but there seems to be a lot in common, even when there are differences. So that's right. the, the key thing there. 
Totally. Um, cool. So the, the amazing idea here is it simplifies the task of trying to understand trillions of synapses in the cortex, just trying to decipher the microcircuit. Um, so there's a bunch of people working on this. Uh, my goal is not to review them, but I think there are some really interesting concepts from predictive coding and adaptive resonance theory that may or may not be applicable to HTM. And sort of, you can think about parts of my paper as trying to cherry pick ideas from these other uh, models of what's going on in the canonical microcircuit and see how we can augment HTM to include portions of that. The thing that seems to be agreed upon, the theme between all of these, is that the macro column in some sense seems to be an unsupervised prediction machine. Now there's lots of sort of disagreements on the special features in them, but there seems to be broad agreement that it's somehow predicting its input. Um, so the model I put together tries to propose how one simple circuit uh, somewhat simple circuit can do all six of these things. Um, and it builds on top of a lot of the folks that you folks have been working on, uh, as well as add some additional things. So I'll sort of dive right into it. So the first thing I did, which was time consuming, was to map all of the neurobiologically available information on what the actual connectivity is. The question marks here are inferred. So for example, uh, there's lots of evidence that higher order thalamus projects to layer 5A. I have not found any evidence of specifically which neurons it projects to. So I try to be transparent about um, the observed connectivity versus the inferred connectivity. What's interesting is there seems to be six main types of excitatory neurons. There are more, so this is not comprehensive. Um, but there are six main types of excitatory neurons that seem to have consistent genetic markers. Um, so uh, the uh, neurobiologists can regularly find for example, these L5 ARS neurons throughout all of sensory cortex, and they seem to always have this, the same genetic marker, and they seem to always project to the striatum as an example. So I took that, also tried to incorporate the data on the relative numbers. So as you said, Jeff, you're 100% right. There are variations in the relative ratios of these different neuron types in different areas of sensory cortex. Um, there seems to be a consistent theme, though, that the two most numerous types of neurons are these L23 pyramidal neurons, and these L6A cortical thalamic neurons. So I tried in our sort of conceptual model here to incorporate the relative counts. The most infrequently found neurons seem to be these L5 neurons. Um, and perhaps the relative numbers of these neuron types are instructive into the computations being performed. So in the model I'm gonna walk through, I'm gonna use this sort of conceptual model. Of course, there are more mini columns that I'm presenting here, I'm sort of simplifying. I'm going to incorporate uh, activated neurons by denoting them by uh, more filled in colors. Um, and uh, you'll see where I sort of take it. So let's talk about sequence prediction. So there's two canonical computations I'm going to invoke over and over and over again. Um, so I think it's useful just to make sure we're aligned on how this work. One, uh, one is directly from your folks' 2016 idea. I think what's cool is this concept, I think, applies outside of just layer two, three. Um, so I'm going to apply the same idea that if you get dendritic spikes and you put neurons in a sub-threshold depolarized state when they're in a winner-take-all network, and then you activate them with proximal input, you will get a different sparse pattern. And I think that concept might apply in other components of the microcircuit. But we, we just, if you don't mind me just jumping please. in, and, um, we make that assumption too. Uh, we assume that pretty much all parameter neurons would have this property. Cool. Um, Although we did not have not exploited it yet, but we think this idea that there's two different types of representations uh, that can occur this sort of predictive state. And we think we're agreeing with you. We think everywhere you see, I think everywhere you see stellate cells and pyramidal cells, that this principle applies. Yep. And what's cool also, you there's a lot of evidence that also happens in thalmocortical relay cells, um, where modulatory distal input puts them in these sub-threshold predictive states, which make them burst instead of uh, uh, tonically fired, which I think also might have impact. Um, cool. So one is this idea. The other idea I'm going to regularly invoke is this concept of pattern, se pattern separation, uh, which is the idea that uh, somehow networks of neurons are capable of decorrelating overlapping input. Um, and there's been a lot of people that have modeled how this can happen. But the idea is if you have a sub pattern, so let's say this represents some object X, if you have a sub pattern that's fully overlapping, you can have neurons it's connected to decorrelate that output. In other words, separate the pattern. So there's a lot of people that have proposed how this might happen. It can happen if you're sparsely projecting to these neurons as well as to uh, inhibitory interneurons in a random way, you can get pattern separation. I'm not, I don't describe the exact mechanism, 
but I look for situations where it seems to be the case that one um, network of neurons projects sparsely to another network and somewhat equally to inhibitory neurons as well as excitatory neurons as evidence that something like pattern separation might be happening. I mean, wouldn't you argue that the, it's already separated in that uh, sparse representation in the layer two, three cells as you're showing here? I mean, it, wouldn't you say that's already separated? Those, if I look at the actual neurons that are active, not the mating columns, they're separate patterns. Um, so um, I'm just trying to get your language here because I think what you're actually saying, you want to be able to recognize it elsewhere or something like that. Um, yes, so the key thing um, I'm trying to get to is how does the fact that this subpattern Y might mean something completely different than this overlapping subpattern Z, how is that communicated from the macro column to other places in the brain? I mean, if I just, if I just project those cells, they're a completely different set of cells. And so I would, I would, uh, that would be obvious there too, right? Um, yes, you could 100% do that, which, which for sure might happen in L2, 3, cortico, cortical neurons for sure. Yeah. But I guess what I think is interesting is I'm following the connectivity to these, these neurons within the macro column that projects to subcortical areas, such as these layer 5B neurons, yeah. I'm trying yeah. to infer what are they doing. So it's not the case that uh, this network cannot perform the type of computations you're saying, but I think there might be other layers that are taking that pattern and somehow synthesizing it and passing it elsewhere. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I, I just, I think I know where you're going in this because I read your paper, but I just want to make point that, that, that there is, these are already separated. Um, For sure. And, it's, it, it, and layer two, three cells do project, but not subcortically, right? They project to yeah. other uh, columns. So, um, but you're trying to get to a, a subcortical projection. Yep. Maybe yep. One, one advantage of this lower representation is it's much lower dimensionality. So, there are the number of axons you have to project to communicate that information yeah. could be much yeah. smaller. And also, so I think I should see argument there. Yeah, but I also think where you're going, Max, is you're going to argue that these, these red cells here, these layer five cells, are going to become a form of stable pattern over the sequence. Yes. Which is, which is what we call temporal pooling, which we've also modeled, but not in specifically that layer of cells. Yep, yep. You're already, you're already ahead of the curve. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, uh, I follow the connectivity that you folks do. I propose that layer four cell eight cells perform simply coincidence detection. A lot of evidence of this. Um, if you just record LGN neurons, they're response, responsive to center surround receptive fields in your eye. Layer four neurons are responsive to lines of specific orientations and, and similar locations. Of course, that conceptually is just coincidence detection. You see this in other cortical areas as well. Similarly to how you folks model, I, I use pretty much the same exact idea that these layer four stellite cells project uh, in a mini column. Um, so an object A, whether it be you know, a pattern of somatosensory input, a pattern of visual input, uh, auditory input, will be represented by a population of mini columns being activated. So now the interesting thing is time. Um, can, and, I, can I go back to that on the previous slide? I don't want to delay things here too. Um, it's interesting you chose to represent layer four as a single cell. In, in some sense, we, we do our, what we call our spatial pooling, which is this activation of minicoms. But we assume it's an inhibitory cell that does that. We assume it's the, um, the bipolar or double bouquet cells that actually enforce mm. that minicom to become active. I don't know if you know that or not, but, but because you know, there are a lot of layer four cells. Yep. And um, there's quite a few of them actually in, in, the, in, in many parts of the cortex. So you've sort of abstracted those way to, to what we would call the spatial pooler. But, um, we, but we actually think that role is, is performed by different cells, uh, the inhibitory cells. But it's just pointing out the differences here because you've kind of yep. abstracted away any sort of a very, what we consider a meaningful role of layer four. Got it. No, um, that makes but, sense. Yeah, but it's okay. We, we make lots of assumptions. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. Um, okay, so times. This is where I think things get really interesting, and I love the general concept of HTM, which is that what all these other models don't incorporate, which is true of most predictive coding models, as well as adaptive resonance theory is this idea of time. So intuitively, you know, if I look at this picture, my mind immediately projects forward in time. I can almost see her kicking the ball. Um, a more potent example of this that I love doing for people is one shot sequence learning. So I'm gonna play three notes. It's not gonna be magical music. Then I'm gonna play the same two notes, not the third one, and your brain will instantaneously in your head be able to hear the three, the three notes. It's like, it's trivial, it's a joke, but it's actually fascinating that your brain just did that. You one shot learned an exact sequence. 
Interestingly, also, your brain can one shot do, can disambiguate between fully overlapping sequences. So I'm gonna play uh, two sequences of notes. The middle three notes are completely exactly the same. The only difference is the first note and the last note. Then I'm gonna play one of these two sequences and omit the last note. And I guarantee every single one of you will easily be able to tell which sequence it is. It's obviously a high note. So how did your brain just do that? It was, you weren't even thinking about it and your brain did that. So I, I'm like super fascinated in how that was so trivial and maybe that's somehow insightful into one shot learning. So the three features of this one shot sequence learning I'm really interested in is the one shot learning of sequences, disambiguating uh, overlapping sequences and one shot prediction of the next element. Um, so let's start by just rapidly inputting ABC. I'm gonna assume there's no delay between them. That's something I'm gonna sort of extend later. So you input this object A, then right afterwards you input this object B, and then right after you input this object C. How does the a macro column learn this sequence? So the first thing that I think is happening, uh, or I you know, hypothesize is happening, is these layer 5A neurons do pattern separation and enable this sort of uh, recursive uh, projections between layer 2, 3, and layer 5A. The connectivity is highly consistent with that, but there's no you know, definitive evidence for it. But what would happen is if you had pattern separation this way, uh, one input A would create a pattern separated representation layer 5A. And then what would happen is this would project back in sort of a random way and depolarize some random subset of them. Now, if you input B, you're gonna get sort of the pattern, uh, sort of the sparse pattern that you folks were proposing was coming from layer two, three via this layer 5A sort of random connectivity. And if you play that forward, same thing sort of happens. This representation of C ends up actually being also a code for the sequence ABC. So same general concept that you folks have been proposing. What's different though, or perhaps different, maybe I you know, don't fully, I didn't read everything, is that now you can one shot replay this. So, so there's a variety of ways this happens. This happen through just sort of short-term plasticity. It could happen through gamma oscillation. So if you know, A originally is, input for a, free, a sufficient amount of time that you get gamma oscillations, you can show that you very quickly will get short-term potentiation. But the interesting thing is inputting this just once, you can potentially get replay. And there's a lot of evidence that within the cortex, you can actually see replay within layer two, three. Okay, I don't think that's different than our network. Our network could also do this in one shot replay. I think what you've done is to sort of, we've, as you point out, we've, we've assumed that the connections between layer two, three cells or these layers in, in the upper mini columns are learning the transitions okay. and you're, you're assigned to a different set of cells and projecting back for different purposes. But Got um, I think they both do the same thing in that regard. Cool. Um, I mean, by these requirements, you're specifying max, these are also requirements we had <clears throat> when we worked on our circuitry. So um, Got it. familiar to us. Cool. Um, so then the, the sort of second idea here, which is what you were getting at before, is that these layer 5B neurons, if they're doing pattern separation, will have a lower dimensionality output that is unique to any one of these sparse patterns, even if they're highly overlapping. And the proposal, exactly as you said, Jeff, is after learning, I'll explain how this happens later, suspend your disbelief for a second. After learning, the pattern separated output in layer 5B that represents the C from ABC, meaning the sequence ABC, gets mapped to the whole sequence. So it becomes a common output for the entire sequence. So the next time you input A, it's actually gonna output the code for ABC. And if this occurs, if I can convince you that, that something like this is happening, then the macro column has one shot generated a unique code for the entire sequence of this. Um, so I'll suspend your disbelief for a second. I'll, I'll walk through how I think that happens. But assuming this happens, you can see very easily how even though these sequences are highly overlapping, in the brain they're represented completely differently. Uh, because the begin the first input is different, you get different layer five B output, and you get different sparse patterns. Very similar to how you folks have modeled things. But I don't think that this you you might disagree with me on this, but I don't think this really demonstrates uh, everything you need on prediction. Because you can say out loud, "I know that the next note is going to sound like blah," and you can you can hum it, which means that around your brain, the language area, etc., needs to somehow get this output which is the prediction that C is coming next. 
So, so what I'm looking for is at least some subcortical output that is passing the prediction of the next elements um, that is a code that represents that. And what so I, I, think, I, I don't know if you want feedback as you're going, Max. Or, yeah, yeah, please. I'm not. So, so we've, we've, we make this, um, we break this down into two things. We call them active prediction. Uh, and active prediction is a cell that actually is firing, mm -hmm. which is in a predictive state, which we're going to argue is these layer six cells in a moment. But, uh, but we think that most of the prediction in your brain, you're not even aware of. You're just, you're just not even, in, you, in some sense, you have to attend to it to know, right. to make that, to make, hear it in your head. Yeah. The vast majority of times when you're dealing with the world, you're not, you don't hear these things. I don't imagine what my finger is going to feel when I touch something. When I'm in the elevator listening to the elevator music, I'm not, I don't think I'm hearing the next note, but I do know what it's wrong. Mm -hmm. So we make this distinction between there's really got to be two types of predictions going on. The vast majority of them in our minds occur um, silently inside of neurons, and uh, they don't generate any kind of output, but you know when they're wrong. And mm -hmm. then if you attend to something, and I say, oh, what's the next note, or think about this, or then there has to be an active set of cells. We did not address that in any of our papers. Mm -hmm. uh, we assumed that it has to exist, so I think you need both of them. Got it. Makes sense. So yeah, so in that context, then what I'm looking for is the active prediction neurons, which I'm proposing happen uh, in these layer 6a cortical thalamic neurons. Which I so, like that idea, by the way, I, I think because they're simple cells. And, and so uh, I've always, you know, we always have to say, where is those active prediction cells? Right, right, right. Cool. Yeah, and the connectivity is really interesting because these neurons have their apical dendrites in layer 4. Um, which is exactly where the input um, that these layer four simple cells um, are detecting coincidences. So when you when an object is represented in a macro column, the idea would be that these stellite cells actually fire, but a pattern of layer six A cortical thalamic neurons are in a predictive state because you get dendritic spikes. Now, if that's the case, you also see that these layer five B neurons also project to these layer six A cortical thalamic neurons. And it's the case that we can regularly see that these layer 6a cortical thalamic neurons uh, potently activate inhibitory neurons and, act and inhibit each other. It seems to be a winner take all network. So if you merge these things together, what you will get for every element in a sequence is a unique sequence element code. So I have a question about this, Max. Please. Maybe I, maybe I missed, missed something here, but it seems like there's a problem here. Uh, one of the problems is that you can have lots of uh, the same element repeated multiple times in a sequence. And sometimes they can repeat it multiple times, you know, you, you can have the same note repeated three times in a row. And there has to be unique representation for each one of those. Uh, because you then on the fourth note predict something different. And so it seems if you're using your stable layer five code as to sort of the disambiguation of the input, it's not sufficient to, to, to say, oh, this is the second B in the sequence. This is the third yeah. B in the sequence and so on. Did I miss that? Or is that, is that something you haven't addressed yet? No, you're absolutely right. That is, that is an issue. And I think the, um, the way I've been thinking about that is I think there might be, there has to be something special going on um, when you, when you re-represent something again. Um, so, so for example, in the idea of saying B four times, um, if I go B, 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 C, I think there must, I think there's something involving the striatum happening because the striatum seems to be very, very involved with things like beat based timing. So I think there's some sort of refreshing going on. Yeah, there. maybe. Although I used, I used to often use the example, it doesn't have to be timing either. I use the example of a sentence. I say there are too many two twos in this sentence to count. Yeah. And you have, the, you have the sound two appearing multiple times and right. this one has to be represented differently. You know, I just want to point out that where, if you actually allow the connections between the sparse representations in layer two, three, that, as we proposed, if you allow those to learn transitions, and it may be in addition to your label, layer five stable output, because that's like, the, that's the label of the sequence. Yeah. But if you allow those uh, neurons, the sparse representations in any column to connect one another, uh, they solve that problem. You, you just end up with a unique representation for the repeated element each time. And I think it's a little bit, it's a bit of a stretch to say, oh, I'm going to rely on the striatum for that because, I mean, I think this is a ubiquitous property everywhere in the brain. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it, we do it in motor sequences. We do it everything. It's in language. It's in, um, uh, it's almost everywhere. So I just want to point out that I think one of the things you lost by, by you're going to, you argue that layer two, three connections are really sort of forming stable patterns and not learning the sequence mm -hmm. themselves. And one of the things you lose is that ability to repeat uh, elements in the sequence. And so yep. I think that has to be addressed.
No, you're right. That, that's definitely a limitation. I appreciate the feedback. Um, cool. So the idea, at least, is for non-overlapping elements within a sequence, um, you can get unique codes for this. And the idea, interestingly, is if you follow the connectivity of these layer 6a CT neurons, you see something that seems at least highly consistent with the notion of prediction. So there's evidence that came out six years ago that they put these layer 4 stellite cells into predictive states. They synapse onto mod and to distal uh, dendrites and layer 4. And they synapse on distal dendrites on the relay neurons that go to the same exact macro column. And they've also shown that uh, these relay neurons in the thalamus only burst when they get such subthreshold input. So there's some interesting things that at least seem consistent with the idea that these layer six A neurons are somehow predicting the next element. Which, uh, sorry, which paper is that on, that show the bursting in relay cells? Is that the I, I, all? It's later. I'll, I'll, oh, okay. Uh, okay. I didn't, I didn't have that here, but I, I, I in the next section, I, I cited. it. Okay. Yeah. Um, cool. So here's just the general idea. So subcortically, these are passing predictions of the next element. Um, cool. So here's an idea of how these three things happen. Where I think things start getting more interesting uh, is when you start asking about working memory. So a key flawed assumption, at least my model made thus far, is that there was no delay between the input of sequences. And the reason that was essential is because in order for the sparse pattern of B, for example, to show up, it needed to be input within the time window that it was subthreshold depolarized from these layer 5A neurons projecting onto it. So if I input A, pause five seconds, and then input B, pause five seconds, input C, clearly a human can learn that sequence. But the network I proposed here would not. So the question is, how do we sort of cascade these things across time? And that's sort of where I'm going to propose an idea of how working memory might happen. Can I just, again, I, I'm, I'm trying to be concerned for the people on our side of the fence here, Max. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So from our work, I just want to make it clear that Max is trying to deal with a different problem. We've, we've dealt with timing in uh, the timing of a sequence as in like the, the tempo and the, of a melody and the relative timing of notes in a melody. Well, we haven't even thought about this. Max, you didn't deal with that. You're dealing with a different problem, yep. which is a working memory problem. Um, and so I just wanna just parse it out. These are two separate timing issues. Yep. One, and you're dealing with sort of a working memory type of thing, not the melody. Um, so in this example, then the delay is almost something you wanna ignore. Right, you don't really care whether it's a one second delay or a five second delay or a four second. It could be, it's just yeah, the right. fact that you in have my, in my these example, notes yeah. in sequence, in your yeah. example, yeah. yeah. Yep. As opposed yeah. to a melody where the specific timing really matters. Yep. Right. Um, and, and in the melody, it's been shown that the specific timing can, you could do it up to about 800 milliseconds. So mm -hmm. beyond that, you can't really keep it, you can't learn the duration of a note. You have to start counting. Interesting. So there's a there's an inch, there's a built-in mechanism which we hypothesize about what it is that basically can do this very specific relative timing up to 800 milliseconds. And not only do you learn the relative time, you, you can speed it up and slow it down, which is mm -hmm. like you know, it's play a melody back quicker or slower. Um, so that's another requirement. But you're doing something completely different here. This is working on. Cool. Okay. So the problem statement which we just stipulated is how does humans how do humans learn sequences when inputs are delayed? So there's three models. I'm not going to review all of them, but just for folks that are interested in alternative ways people have tried to model working memory, there's three main models out there. One is a tractor network models, the idea that representations maintain themselves for the delay period. There's bi-stability models, which is the idea that the neurons don't fire, but they remain in some sort of on state or up state during the delay period. And then the third is that somehow working memory is maintained in short-term weight changes. So the model I propose is very much in the third category. The reason why the third category um, has benefits is the first two struggle to understand how would it be the case that you could store multiple elements simultaneously because attractor states are very sensitive uh, to parameter changes. It's hard to imagine how uh, an attractor state would maintain multiple representations simultaneously. Um, also, how could you maintain something in working memory without disrupting uh, ongoing sensory processing? So attractor network models struggle to examine uh, sort of explain how that would happen. So as a proposal of how this happens just with synaptic weights. Okay, so here's our learning paradigm. Input A, pause, B, pause, C. So the proposal here is that the origin for this comes from the hippocampus. So we know that the hippocampus 
on the theta uh, cycle will output a consistent place code. I'm going to call an episode code since I'm not referring to a location in space, but I'm referring to the same exact computational thing. Um, and we know that it projects extensively to the sort of medial prefrontal cortex. And what we also know, interestingly, is that the ACC and the medial prefrontal cortex seems to project over many, many areas of sensory cortex, specifically to these layer 6A neurons. It's also the case, interestingly, that CA1 projects specifically to layer 6A in higher order sensory cortex. So there seems to be this, sorry, looks, you were you about to ask something, Jeff? Uh, sorry. That's no, jump in. I don't mind. Uh, I was curious. I, I'm just wondering, I don't know that projection. Do you know that if it's that to apical dendrites or is it to, is it more to basal um, dendrites, um, that projection? They, I know that they use genetic markers, so it wasn't just the layer in which it, uh, the axons were physically located. I know they showed that specifically they synapsed onto these NTSR neurons, which are the layer 6A neurons. I don't remember if they- So it could be layer one, it could be direct. Um, yes, I think that's right. the case, yeah. I mean, because if it's layer one, then there's a general rule about any backward projection, cortical mm -hmm. region to region projects heavily to layer one. So then that would be sort of a general purpose of uh, yep. methodology. The, uh, the CA1 tracing though, I know specifically showed that CA1 projects to mostly to layer six in the higher order cortex, which was an interesting finding. Uh, but that goes through the prefrontal cortex, and not directly, right? There are, there are some direct projections. I'll oh, send there you are some It's very yeah. interesting, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's only the higher order sensory cortex though, so you don't see it in V1, but you see it in like yeah. IT. Yeah. Um, so another interesting finding is you see uh, theta oscillations only in working memory tasks do you see entrainment between these sort of three structures? So in non-working memory tax, sensory cortex seems to mostly oscillate on alpha, but when you start trying to remember things over delay periods, you see sensory cortex start oscillating more on theta. Um, it also seems to causally propagate from the hippocampus to the ACC, then to sensory cortex. So if you sort of do timing studies, you can see that the, the uh, oscillations seem to propagate in that direction. So the idea is that these, these episode codes enable you to reactivate representations in the absence of sensory input. So if it's the case that you project to these layer six A neurons, it has been shown that they provide driving input to these layer five A neurons, which have been shown to provide driving input back to layer two, three. So there's some evidence that's supportive of this. Again, obviously not definitive evidence or proof, um, but working memory seems to activate all layers except layer four. So during delay periods, you seem to see silence in layer four, but activation in other layers. Uh, it seems to be the case. So some models of working memory propose that prefrontal cortex sort of mirrors a representation in sensory cortex, but it's not actually being re-represented in sensory cortex. A lot of um, recording studies are inconsistent with that. For example, if I record a neuron that's responsive to someone's face and I ask you to remember that person's face, we see to see you we seem to see reactivation of the same neuron that was activated during the actual sensory experience. So it seems to reactivate the same neurons. Also, we see evidence that firing starts in the deep layers and propagates upwards. And it seems to be the case that replay is triggered by the hippocampus. So there's some interesting consistencies with this idea. Um, so let me walk through how this, uh, I propose this might work. So if it's the case that CA1 keeps replaying the same episode code every 200 milliseconds, now I'm going to propose that just the replay of the same episode code, doesn't have to be anything smart happening in the hippocampus, it just has to be the same code over and over and over again, will immediately make it possible for you to connect A, B, and C across this, this sort of pause. The one additional mechanism that you kind of need is uh, timing within the macro column. So timing, in other, not the timing you're describing, but coordination between macro columns. So they have to sort of aggregate input at the same time. So I propose that there are sort of input states and output states. There's a lot of evidence that suggests uh, that when layer four is activated, it actually inhibits layer five. Uh, and when the deep layers are activated, it kind of inhibits the superficial layers. So there, I propose that when a macro column's receiving input, it's not sending its output. And then when it's passing its, its output, it's not aggregating actual sensory experience. And this is an important uh, mechanism for, for what I'm about to describe. So now the idea is the entrainment, the consistency between the structures is the input output states oscillating 
such that the output states happen at the same time as the hippocampal replay. So let's sort of follow the dynamic of what might happen. This is where you're going to see the stable sequence codes in layer 5b be represented. So let's say a random code happens to these layer 6a neurons, randomly activates a subset of them, which randomly activates a subset of these layer 5a neurons, which project to these layer 2-3 network. The idea is when A is first experienced, you create a mapping between this random episode code and the actual most recently experienced sensory experience. So what ends up happening is in the next output state, you see a pattern separated output from uh, layer 5B. Now a key feature, these layer 5B neurons seem to burst for a very long period of time. So they seem to burst between 50 and 200 milliseconds and they seem to be uh, insensitive to any other output. So what that implies is any other representations in layer two, three that occur during this output state will not change the, C, the layer five B output. And this is gonna be key to sort of learning a stable output. So then there's a replay. While this is outputting, the, if the uh, hippocampus fires that same representation, then you'll just replay A again. And now when you replay A, then you get this sort of biasing. Okay, so nothing too crazy, but every output state during the input of A, you're just gonna get a replay of A. During the delay period, so now I'm going to the delay period, there's no sensory experience, but during the output state, um, the idea is that you keep getting this replay. As long as you're attending to it, meaning you're maintaining the theta oscillation entrainment, and the same episode code is playing, you're just gonna keep getting replay of A over and over again. And a consistent sequence biasing from these layer 5B neur 5A neurons. So now the intuition maybe is somewhat uh, obvious now. When B is input, you're still going to get the sparse representation of B because every output state consistently, the hippocampus is driving a replay of the same sequence biasing. So then, then the next time there's a replay, you get a replay not just of A, but you get A, B, a and then B. And then you, then you will get a sparse pattern from uh, the layer five ARS neurons specific to the sequence A then B. So you can kind of play this forward. Uh, during this delay period, you're just gonna keep replaying A then B, A then B, A then B. And then when you input C, then you get the same sparse pattern for just C. So the other key thing though, is during these replay episodes, notice the, R, the, uh, the layer five B um, neurons that are being bursted throughout the entire output period are specific to the pattern separated L23 neurons for the sequence ABC. And the idea is that during this replay, because they burst for, for 50 to 200 milliseconds, you're building plasticity between A, B, and C to the same sequence code. So the idea is if you keep triggering a replay of A, which then goes to B, which then goes to C, and you're enforcing the layer 5B neurons to burst, in a pattern that's representative of specifically the sequence ABC, then you're building plasticity now between A and B and C to the same output code. Did I go too fast or did that make any intuitive <laughs> so sense? You're, uh, so, this, so this plasticity is, uh, uh, this con these connections are being reinforced during this delay period. Exactly. Right? Does exactly. that mean that the longer the delay, the faster you're gonna learn? Because uh, you, Because you're gonna reinforce it multiple times? Uh, during the delay or I think or the, does it not matter it might matter no that's an interesting proposal um I didn't I didn't I didn't really consider the requirement for the delay um for the the length of the delay period I'm not sure that's an interesting idea. okay but but during the delay basically the, these connections these random well the, the, these connections are being reinforced through this connection with this random episode code yes that's every funny. every replay every replay reinforces the mapping of the entire okay. replay to the final output code. To the final, yeah. And the, suppose you're now doing inference on the sequence, you know, some time later, you know, many days later or whatever. Uh, you don't need to have the same episode code, right? It, now you've built up these connections. Now exactly. you can uh, do that. Okay. Exactly. So that's that's sort of a concept of how perhaps the hippocampus kind of trains the neocortex, and over time, the neocortex doesn't require the hippocampus. It might provide ideas on how that might happen. So uh, okay. I, have a I have a question about this, but it's, it's not about the mechanism, it's about something that's not in the mechanism. So if you, okay. if you want to finish the mechanism, then- Okay, um, I, I will, uh, I'll 
quickly finish. I have two more slides on the mechanism and we can go there. So the idea here conceptually is the next time A is input into a macro column, the output will be a unique sequence code for ABC instead of the original pattern separated output for just A. Um, and what's interesting is it sort of provides maybe in intuition on how episodic memory works, which is the, a, an episode code can reactivate a bunch of macro columns simultaneously through layer 6A. And there's three pieces of evidence that's supportive of this. People with hippocampal damage and rats with hippocampal damage are very impaired with sequence learning. Uh, trace conditioning across not just mammals, but also in amphibians and fish. If you remove their, the analog of the, uh, the, the homolog of the hippocampus, they are unable to perform trace conditioning, meaning they cannot connect things with delay periods. Um, it also seems to be the case that the hippocampus is necessary for new memory. So maybe provides intuition uh, or concepts on how this might happen. Okay, Jeff, take it away. So um, we're talking about the layer five intrinsic bursting cells um, and playing this role. And you're, you're proposing a, a, a mechanism or why they do this intrinsically bursting uh, physiological thing. Um, but just a little aside, by the way, in some animals, that's in, it's labeled layer 5A and some it's layer 5B. So really saying A and B doesn't really help. You have to say it's okay. regular spiking. Got it. Um, so, but you did, in your paper, you always said RS or IB. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so now the question is, those are very interesting cells. Those layer 5 intrinsically bursting cells, they are, they are known to be the motor output of the cortex everywhere. In every cortical root column everywhere. They are the vet cells in the motor cortex. But so they have a motor role. They also, and so they just project subcortically uh, to some motor center. And they also split their axon and project to uh, higher order relay cells in the thalamus. And so this dual role is very perplexing. Um, how is the motor output is going subcortically? Or is that what we're projecting to the next region also a motor output or not? But I, as far as I can tell, you're not, you're not addressing those roles at all here. You're, you're giving them a different role, um, which is sort of this uh, help, like, helping us do this integration of working memory. And first, a question for you is, have you thought about how those intrinsically bursting cells could also be representing behavior? How is it that they are behavior cells as well as doing this? Um, and have you thought about the other question like, well, how could they be projecting forward as well in the cortex? Yeah, so, so uh, thoughts on that are, um, if it's the case that progressively higher levels of cortex are trying to do some form of a progressive unsupervised clustering, then the idea is these layer, these intrinsically bursting neurons are clustering a sequence of input. So third layer of cortex represents sequences of sequences of sequences, an object in the third layer of cortex. The subcortical motor output, perhaps, here's a, this is how I'm thinking about it, is the reason that's useful is these subcortical motor areas are trying to learn the, the, the object that exists. So for example, the superior colliculus, the projection from layer 5B to the superior colliculus, you can actually look around a room without a V1. You can, you can throw something at someone's face and they'll blink. They, they can still see, but they don't, perce they don't perceive sight. The idea being that V1, V2, V4, what it's helping the superior colliculus do is recognize objects. So the superior colliculus can then learn mappings between these stable codes and some meaningful Okay, thing. that's interesting. Okay, that's interesting. Um, I have a completely different take on it. Doesn't mean it's right. Um, but just, just for, might be useful for you to think about it this way. Um, my assumption is that the superior colliculus does its thing. And what the cortex is trying to do is it's trying to say, look, I, I have a better model of the world than you do, Super mm -hmm. I know what's going on up here. You're just pretty dumb and old. Um, <laughs> I, I'm gonna, but I can't control muscles myself. So I have to, I have to talk to you to do something. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the superior colliculus is the thing that controls eye movements. And so the cortex doesn't really want to control eye movements. It wants to control, it wants to suggest to the superior colliculus, here's how I'd like you to move at this point mm -hmm. in time. And so to my view, those connections are learned that the cortex, um, Sends, it's, try, it's basically saying, I have a code that, uh, that, that I want you to associate with the behavior you're exhibiting right now. And, and therefore, in the future, if I give you that code, you might do that behavior for me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not teaching the superior colliculus what's going on in the world. It's just the cortex is taking advantage of it and saying, please do my right. bidding at this point in time. It's a very different view than what you've had. 
Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't mean it's right. I'm just pointing out it's different. Yeah, um, yeah, no, that's interesting. One, um, one, one additional thought there, which uh, maybe is consistent with both views, is these layer five B neurons also project extensively to the striatum um, across all of sensory cortex. And, it, and that striatum also then projects uh, to superior colliculus and other motor areas. So you might, you might imagine something where when these layer five B neurons post a, I think the object we're observing is object A or sequence A, then through reinforcement learning in the striatum, I can learn, is this a good object or is this a bad object? What behavior do I want to do in reaction to this object? Mm -hmm. And the striatum can, can learn through reinforcement learning the mapping between objects and behavior, perhaps. Yeah. So that's something I'm, I've been yeah. thinking a lot about. Another, another thing that's worth considering here is, um, you, you went over it very briefly here, uh, the idea that you're proposing that there's two states alternating uh, all the time mm -hmm. in the cortex between inputs and outputs, inputs and outputs. And uh, you didn't say it here, but in your paper, you said that's an, assuming it's an alpha frequency. Yep. And, um, and we kind of came to not that exactly that conclusion, but the layer five cells themselves, one of the possibilities how you can explain the layer five intrinsically bursting cells is that you know they're projecting forward in cortex and they're also projecting down motor behavior and um i find i find that difficult to understand and so one of the one of the things we came up with is an idea we haven't really pursued this much but it was in the 2019 paper um that that the layer five cells are, are alternating um, um on a cycle between the meaning having a meaningful output subcortically, which is a motor behavior, and a meaningful output um, cortical cortically, uh, which is not a motor behavior. Um, so this, but we only did it at the layer five cells. We didn't propose that the entire cortical column is oscillating between inputs and outputs, mm. which is an interesting idea of yours. Um, but that just the layer five cells themselves could be oscillating between two different states, two different meanings. Um, mm. We associated with these things we call displacement cells. Uh, but I, I'm just I'm just trying to make these contrasts to yeah, help yeah, yeah. clarify things here. And I'm, I'm also just making sure I understood your model correctly because um, I went through it. I said, oh, these are things you did that were really kind of cool and clever. And these are things I think, well, you didn't address this issue. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to give you a chance to make sure I mis didn't misunderstand yeah. that. But yeah. anyway, you're, you're giving these intrinsic bursting cells in some sense a different function um, and not really addressing directly their motor behavior. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Which I think we have to address because it is the motor output of the cortex. Yeah, yeah. So, that, so something else has, has to be added to this. Yeah. You know. Cool. So I um, are we? Do I have? I have ten minutes left. Is that right? I'll try and go fast. Um, yeah, we have we have a little bit of time. Okay. So another interesting thing. I think you folks have solved this problem differently. So so um, I'll describe sort of what I've taken from predictive coding and adaptive resonance theory that might be aug maybe use useful to augment um, how you folks have thought about this. But the problem that I was trying to solve was uh, sort of the catastrophic forgetting or the stability plasticity dilemma, which is if you have continuous streaming input really from birth to death to the neocortex for 80 years, how do you ensure as it learns new things that it doesn't accidentally forget old things? Um, and uh, HTM, or sorry, art and predictive coding suggests that this happens through gating learning using surprise. So the idea is you only learn when your predictions have failed. Otherwise, we don't update representations. Um, now, predictive coding has pretty biologically, in my opinion, implausible mechanisms for how this happens. So I didn't find it particularly convincing. But Stephen Grossberg came up with a very interesting idea on how match versus mismatch might be signaled in the thalamus that I think might be worth um, considering. So the idea is these layer six A neurons project back to the same relay neurons that project into a macro column. And what we want to happen is somehow success versus failure of these predictions, meaning I correctly predicted my upcoming input or I failed to be signaled differently. So if you look inside the thalamus, here's where uh, Subutai, I, I reference the uh, relay neurons burst only when getting subthreshold modulatory input. Those are the papers. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and what you can show is these layer six A neurons project to distal synapses and do not uh, drive output on these relay neurons, but they do put them into an upstate. Um, in other words, a predictive state. And if you take one of these upstate relay neurons and give it driving input, it will burst. So the idea now is when 
predictions are matched, you will get bursting of these relay neurons. When they are failed, you only get tonic firing. And perhaps this somehow is used in macro columns to decide whether I'm going to potentiate synapses on these layer four inputs or I'm going to do long-term depression. So that's one sort of interesting idea for match versus mismatch. Stephen Grossberg also proposes some neuromodulatory mechanisms for uh, what's the threshold for a successful match versus a mismatch, which is some interesting ideas in there. Also, what he also proposes, which I find interesting, is this idea that there is an explicit surprise signaled by these sort of intralaminar thalamic neurons. So there's not proof of this, but the connectivity is consistent with this idea that TRN, which is this inhibitory layer around all of thalamus, has electrical coupling. And it seems to be the case that these layer 6A neurons only synapse back on inhibitory neurons on core relay neurons, not the, uh, the inhibitory neurons to these major, these major neurons. There was actually a recent paper that further showed that. So what this implies is due to electrical coupling, if you get bursting of core relay neurons, you will get weak matrix neuron firing. If you get tonic firing in relay neurons, you will get bursting in matrix firing. And what's cool is if you record these intralaminar thalamic neurons, you see exactly this dynamic, which is they only seem to fire in the presence of surprise. And if you follow the connectivity, there's further interesting things. These are the only thalamic neurons that project to ACH or tonically active neurons in the striatum. And they've shown that the, the burst pause dynamic of these neurons in the striatum is required for plasticity in, in the striatum. And if you remove the input from the intralaminar thalamus, you, you prevent uh, plasticity in the striatum. So you re it requires a pause in acetylcholine, or I don't really know how to pronounce that word. Um, it's that pause is required for uh, plasticity um, because it inhibits plasticity specifically on direct medium spine neurons. So there's some really interesting things going on here, I think. Um, you can also show these matrix neurons project uh, to a key uh, nucleus that innervates the entire cortex, cortex with ACH. So anyway, some interesting things to think about. In my paper, I propose some specific mechanisms. It's just one of many possible ways this is used. But the idea is that perhaps learning new representations is gated by failed predictions. Any thoughts? Well, you know, I think, you know, that general idea, I think we would uh, agree with the way we modeled uh, failed predictions in our in our 2016 paper is that we get sort of bursting along these mini columns. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you get, you know, an, in, uh, an entire set of mini columns would become active and that triggers, uh, you know, learning of new transitions and, and new sequences. So it doesn't have to kind of leave the layer. Cause if you mm -hmm. think about, you know, every layer, you know, trying to learn sequences, um, you know, it, it, at least in that model, you know, we can learn everything just completely within that layer. So we layer, mm -hmm. we can learn, from mismatches and from surprise uh, just within that. Uh, but uh, this is an interesting idea here as well. Yeah. It's, um, here. It, 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 there's a lot of thoughts about this in my head at the moment. Um, <laughs> I realized I wrote some of this in my new book and I don't think we've written it anywhere else. Um, so uh, no one, you wouldn't be aware of it, but, but we've discussed this at Nementa. There's a, we, we, as soon as I said, we would agree with the general idea that um, that when you have a mismatch, that's a signal to learn, right? That's a signal that something's wrong with your model of the world. And, um, but what I think tied to that is also this, the very key is this idea of attention. So it's, this is more obvious if you're doing sensory motor learning where you're moving your fingers or moving your eyes um, and, and you're going along, all of a sudden there's something in, the, in your uh, uh, sensory field that's not right, it's not predictive. Hmm. What we tend to do in that case of what we do do, not just tend to do, what we do do is our attention is immediately drawn to that thing. And we actually narrow down on input to some subset of the field we were looking at before. We try, and, and what we're, which essentially what we believe, if you're familiar with our 2019 paper, we build a model of the world using reference frames, mm -hmm. um, bits all like reference frames, and that, re, that reference frames are populated with other objects, reference frames, other, so the reference frames that are populated in locations with reference frames. And what you're doing is you're saying, okay, I have a model of something, it has these components of these relationships to each other. One of those is wrong. So I now focus on that, say the thing I thought was that location X is not right. And so I need to relearn that thing at that location X. So it's a much more complex, uh, involved mechanism. It's not inconsistent with what you're saying. It's just more, it's more complex where you have to attend to a subset of our input space. And we think the thalamus is intimately involved in that. 
Uh, it's not just a mismatch. It's like, okay, I have a mismatch. We need to attend. We need to find the location where that thing is. We yep. need to relearn that component of that object. Yep. Um, and so it's, 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 just a, it's a much more complicated um, uh, process um, that's going on. Got I it. Think. Yeah, so this, this kind of circuitry, um, you know, could be tied to kind of this attentional mechanism of, of you know, focusing your attention to these surprise areas and, and yeah. that, that can trigger learning as well. Uh, yeah. So they're not necessarily inconsistent with one another, I think. No, that's, that's I guess that's uh, where I was going. Yeah, and of course, the thalamus has been implicated in all kinds of attention uh, models for, for 30, 40 years. No one really understands it. I, I think, did we, did you ever publish that paper we did with the woman from MIT, what's her name? Um, uh, Carmen. Carmen. Did Carmen Varela. No, we still kind of get together every once in a while uh -huh. to talk about it. We haven't, uh, pub we did, we published it at Cosign. Uh -huh. um, so Max, uh, you, yeah, we, a we, poster. we've been, we spent a fair amount of time studying the thalamic relay cells and th they're complicated. They have these yeah. very unusual uh, synapses. They have multiple ones, only some seem to be used. It almost looks like the thalamus is doing some sort of, um, 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 uh, matrix, um, what am I looking for? Um, like routing or yeah, routing um, gating uh, mechanism. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's another one, but I can't remember. Anyway, a routing mechanism that you can, you can redirect input and change things. And, and so it's doing something really complicated, you know, yeah. it, but it does it with a fairly simple, uh, well described, uh, physiology and anatomy. So, but it's still puzzling to us. So. Yeah. Um, I think you're touching on the surface of something which is more complicated. Anyway, we, we did a paper, Subutai did a paper with Carmen, uh, where we're sort of looking at all these details and trying to speculate what kind of um, functions they might play. Um, so I'm just pointing out that I think it's more complicated than this, but not that I disagree with anything you said here. It's just there's okay. more going on. Jeff, was the word you were reaching for a crossbar? No, it wasn't a crossbar. What's, what's <laughs> a multiplexer? That's what I was thinking of. Well, that's that's the ultimate form of a multiplexer. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, I, but that wasn't the word I was looking for. It's maybe a good word. I was looking for the word multiplexer. Um, cool. Um, do, you, do you have a hard stop? I can. I, we can skip five. I can just go through sensory motor prediction, or do you want? Um, we can go for a little bit longer. Yeah, okay. that, that's fine. So I'll quickly do this. I think this might be uh, might have some interesting overlaps with. Uh, your folks' is grid cells. So I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this. So obviously, as you said, somehow the brain predicts the difference between me moving and the world around me moving. If your eye sort of traces this room, you're getting a stream of different sensory input, but you are aware that it's because your eye is moving, not the world, versus if I showed you this stream of input, your brain can tell that the image is moving, not your eye. So how does this happen? So I attribute this to sort of the corticocortical neurons in layer six. And I think the proposal is, is if let's say in the following simple setup, in your left receptive field, there is a 45 degree bar. And then in your center receptive field, there's nothing. Now the layer five B neurons seem to project sparsely to layer six corticocortical neurons. And the idea is also the motor input from the anterior cingulate also seems to project to layer six. There's no proof that it's, it projects to the corticocortical neurons, but it seems to have axons that go throughout layer six. So if you put these in a predictive state, you might imagine that you end up getting a unique code here that represents uh, a 45 degree bar in this left receptive field and the motor commands look to the left. And that output propagates throughout lateral macro columns. What that means then is if the next thing you see is a 45 degree bar in your center receptive field, you're effectively creating a mapping laterally between macro columns. You're effectively saying, if I'm looking, if I see a 45 degree bar in my left receptive field and I desire to move my eye to the left to look at it, then you end up seeing 45 degree bar in the center. So the next time you do this, so the next time you get a motor command to look to the left, you will get these layer six A neurons to fire before there's any sensory input. So the, the idea is that layer six A is predicting its input before it receives it through these lateral connections. Um, and one, one piece of evidence for this, which again is not definitive at all, but you do see deep layer neurons than sensory cortex with movement related response properties before movement even begins. So you see this movement intention output. So, so uh, is that the end of this slide? Yeah, yeah, go. 
So I, when I read this, I immediately said, oh no, I think you're wrong about this. So I'll tell you why. <laughs> I mean, and, and, then, and then the next two paragraphs later, you said, here's why this might not work. Well, it's a combinatorial <laughs> explosion problem. And th there's been two, uh, and we've, there's been two hypotheses of how this, this, um, this, this remapping or prediction before the, you know, the eye basically, the column predicts what it's going to see before while the eye is moving, right? Yep. And, and so it hasn't gotten the input yet. One is the kind of mechanisms you propose. It's, I don't think are possible. And you pointed, it's, I don't know if you thought of it, one of your reviewers said it, but it's a combinatorial explosion problem. Right. And then you, then you came up with a bunch of ways, well, maybe we can get around it. I don't believe it. Okay. Yeah. The, other, the other way is, you know, oh, it's done with hierarchy. And the, you know, the information goes up to some other higher region and it comes down and tells me what I'm supposed to be looking at. There's a timing problem with that. Yeah. that there's not enough time for it. I don't believe it works either. We have proposed a totally different solution, which I'm almost certain is correct. So I'm just going to boldly say that, oh. um, it, which is the whole idea is if every column is doing learning a complete sensory motor model, you don't need to rely on projections from anywhere else. You just, you, you've got a reference frame. You just need to know where you're moving to the next point in your reference frame, and then you can predict what you're going to see. So it solves that problem elegantly. Um, and I think that's the solution to this problem. So I didn't, I didn't buy this one. I'm, I'll accept it, but I, at this point, I didn't buy this one. And, and you did say it's got a combinatorial explosion problem. Yeah, yeah. It does. Um, uh, that's the problem with this kind of mechanism. But I think it's more elegant to say that, you know, look, every column it doesn't need to rely on someone else. It just says, you tell me how I'm moving, and I will know where I'll be, and I have a model for what, the thing I'm observing, and that model tells me what I should do. Do you think that mechanism thing. solves? Because one problem I was trying to think through that maybe your mechanism solves more elegantly than this is the clear fact that the brain can do one-shot generalization to translation so changes in size, and we still can't do that in basic CNNs. So there's a, that's brings up a whole can of worms that you haven't addressed yet. Evan. But okay. then, you know, even in the sequence memory, something something our sequence memory didn't do, and yours doesn't do either. But I know we have to do it. Is um, is if you want to think about its melodies, you can think about pitch invariance, right? You um, you can play me a sequence, a, a melody, a quick one, I'll remember it in one shot. You can play it back to me a minute later in a different key, and yep. I won't even notice. Yep. And I will predict the correct note in the new key. Yep. Um, so there is a, there's clearly uh, an environment that's introduced there. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually believe that the sequences are learned in the environment form, not mm -hmm. in the original form. There's some evidence both ways, but I believe it's learned in the invariant form. And so yep. there's a whole other step we have to introduce to this. That's one type of invariance, and, and that uh, can be addressed with these, this concept we had called displacement cells, um, which, again, it was in a 2019 paper. Um, um, but there's a whole bunch of invariances, and so, um, and, and we don't really understand this completely, but another one is scale, in, in spatial scale, like, like vision or something like that. And, um, and, and there'd be different mechanisms that might be involved in these different invariances. Uh, so in the spatial scale, um, one of the things we're relying on the theta rhythm is very much intimately uh, tied to uh, the progression of, of, uh, of grid cells, like mm -hmm. you know, path integration movement. Um, and um, if you speed up and slow down the theta rhythm, basically you'll scale everything up and scale everything down. Mm -hmm. um, and so you could change the amount you have to move. Like, for example, if I'm looking at your face and you're close to me or you're further away from me, to scan to saccade from eye to eye, it's, it takes different different amounts of movement. Mm -hmm. I don't. I'm not aware of that. I just think I'm seeing your face, but somehow I've taken a model of your face and I've scaled. I can scale my movements to the appropriate moment in time, mm -hmm. um, which is like, oh, I have to move my eyes left more or left, and I, I'll make the same predictions. So how does it? You know, if I have a single, you know, how do I do that? How do I change from a, a egocentric motor behavior to an allocentric um, movement? behavior, things like that. Yeah. This is a, a big topic here, but I think there's a whole series of topics related to invariance. Um, yeah. and, uh, and, and, and we didn't talk about those much. We, uh, the only place we've ever addressed that at all in any of our papers was this very speculative small section on displacement cells, uh, but we didn't talk about it in the sequence memory. Um, yeah, and we didn't talk about, maybe we mentioned it, but we, we didn't An address interesting it. Uh, supportive fact for that is um, birds that do bird song do not actually learn in a frequency invariant way. Yes, right, right. Same right. thing offset slightly, they don't recognize it all. Yeah, it's a very... Does. Seems to be yeah. neocortical specific, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, 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 exactly. They have a very specific mechanism for learning song, and that's that. Right. But it's really hard for us to tell 
while the song is in a different key. Right. Um, yeah. um, there's a nice, uh, there's this guy, research, I can't remember his name, I can never remember his name, but he wrote the book, you know, This Is Your Brain on Music. And I talked to him about this and he, um, he says that there's evidence actually that we do remember the key that we first heard a song in, but we obviously, we clearly re remember it in an in invariant form as well. So if mm -hmm. someone, if I were to ask you just to play back one of the popular Beatles songs, for example, it's very likely you'd sing it in the correct key. Yeah. Even though you would say, I don't know what key it was in. But if I ask you to say, start on this note, you would be able to do it, no problem. So you're not even aware that you know the right key, but it's there yep. somehow. But anyway, so um, I, think, I, think when you, I think the issue of sensory motor prediction is far more complicated than this. It's yep. really, you know, you have to like, how do I know what I'm going to predict? If you've had, you know, you know, the cop example in like 2019 paper, how do I know what I'm going to predict? It's not just, oh, it was, it was being sensed elsewhere and now I'm moving it. It's like, no, I'm about to touch something or see something that's not even in any part of my receptive field right now. And I'm going to make the correct prediction. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm moving my finger to the part of the cup and I'm not touching it. And I know what, I know what it's going to feel like. So I think this is a much bigger problem. Uh, and personally, I just hope this is the weakest part of your paper, but <laughs> your paper's got a lot of great things in it, so don't get me wrong. Um, I thought this one, like, ah, I don't believe this one. <laughs> got it. Well, I convinced you on a few other things and all. Yeah, but... no, I think it's great. Don't get me wrong. I think there's a lot of really interesting stuff in your paper. I'll skip the other part, but yes, yeah, so lots left to do. Um, I, I haven't done any simulations, so I, I, you know, that stuff. There's a lot of neuron types I haven't incorporated. Um, I want to incorporate the striatum. I'm going to work on frontal cortex. So this is just a passion project I'm having fun with. But uh, I appreciate you folks uh, letting me speak here, and this has been fun. No, thank you for uh, thank you for coming on. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so, so, are you going to actually try to do some simulations? Do you think? Uh, I well, I want, need to partner with someone that can do that better than me. So I've been reaching out to folks. If you folks are interested, I you know would love to do that. Um, but I've been sort of networking with people that would be interested in participating. Where do you want to go with this research? I mean, are you, at right the moment, it's very biological. Do you want, are you interested in translating to machine learning, which is what we're doing right now? Um, wh where's, what's your goal? Do you want to keep working on the neuroscience? <laughs> yeah, I, I think both are really interesting to me. I, I'm a little, as a, my sort of passion project, I'm kind of just seeing where it goes and following the momentum. I think um, modeling it in terms of machine learning is really interesting to me, um, but also just the neuroscience is fascinating to me. Um, so, so I'm kind of like, I'm following both paths and wherever people seem to be most interested, I'll kind of lean in. How much time are you able to dedicate? <laughs> <laughs> this is like my, this is my weekend project when it's, it helps me, the stresses of running a company, it's nice to uh, relax into a textbook. <laughs> so this is, my, this is a side project to stay sane. <laughs> and maybe sheltering in place is helping you. <laughs> to exactly, be more yes, you absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that's an interesting in terms of how we might engage with you on some of this mm -hmm. stuff. It really depends on, you know, what you want to accomplish and what you want to do. Yeah. Um, I think the machine intel, like finding a way to implement this and merge it with HTM or apply some of this in terms of HTM would be very fascinating to me. I would love to help in any way I could. You guys, are you aware of all the work we're doing now in machine learning? Are you familiar with that one? Uh, probably not all of it, but I've, I try to read all the papers you folks release. I don't know what we're yeah. doing. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've, uh, so we've uh, sort of taken this uh, spatial cooler context and the, uh, you know, the s s ways of introdu introducing sparse representations, and we've applied that to machine learning um, and shown that you know, as we would predict from the neuroscience that if you have really sparse representations in, in even in machine learning, you get much more robust representations because mm -hmm. really high dimensional sparse patterns are very unlikely to interfere with one another. That same basic idea can be then applied to catastrophic forgetting and continuous learning. And so we're currently in the middle of figuring out how to add active dendrites to deep learning systems um, and to build in kind of the prediction mechanisms that, mm -hmm. that you discussed um, with the idea that, you know, active dendrites can recognize some sort of context, mm -hmm. um, you know, represented with sparse patterns, then the, the, the output of the network is going to be, become very context dependent. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, by learning different contexts in a way that don't, where the individual contexts don't interfere with one another, you can do actually uh, catastrophic, I mean, you can do continuous learning without catastrophic forgetting. Um, just by exploiting this property of 
sparsity that you know new Very patterns cool. really don't interfere with old ones. I think that's that's almost a requirement. I think for doing uh, continuous learning properly. Do you folks ever plan to incorporate other structures other than the neocortex? Um, so the thalamus is definitely very uh, important to us, as we've, we've talked about. Yeah. Um, you know, we draw a lot of inspiration from the hippocampus and hippocampal formation, but, you know, it doesn't project everywhere in the neocortex. So yeah. I think as a first approximation, we don't want to rely on it, uh, mm -hmm. but I think we get a lot of inspiration from it. I think our tendency, if I had to, at a high level, kind of differentiate between some of the approaches you've taken. You know, yep. Our tendency is to try to just look at the cortical column. What can the cortical column do right. without resorting to external things? Because uh, you know, we think the cortical column is much more powerful than you know, people give it credit and, for. And we would include the thalamus in that. We, we think yeah. we the thalamus, would, yeah, thalamus to us is a thalamus is, a, is another layer or two of the cortex. It's just a couple of But our tendency is to really just look within the the generalized definition of cortical column uh, yep. and all of the functionality rather than saying, okay, it has to come from, you know, this other yeah, like, structure has to come Like from you brought up, you know, when you brought up the whole idea of, uh, of um, uh, working memory, I, okay, that's something we wouldn't include. We would say, no, we're not dealing with blueprint. You know, we're dealing with like, how do I just learn a basic predictive model of the world, right, right, right. Model, model of the world? And I'm not saying, okay, you know, robot, you know, remember these seven things now while we go on to something <laughs> else, right? Yeah. Um, it's like, how do I just understand how, you, know, you, you mentioned watching dishes or, or something like that, but you know, how do we just do these most basic modeling systems? Yep. Things? We, we're so impoverished in our current yep. right now. Um, cool. Yeah. You know, one of the things you didn't mention, which I was in your paper, which I really liked, and it's all right, uh, I just, I'll just throw in an advertising for it right now. You did a nice analysis of the different um, uh, oscillation frequencies mm -hmm. and made a nice proposal. I think that, I don't know if I've ever seen that cohesively before, uh, where you know, oh, here's a proposal for gamma, here's a proposal for alpha, here's a proposal, you know, beta, beta, whatever it was, and then how you know, a different states of of awareness and different states of attention that these different things played in. I thought that was very nice. Uh, that was in the hierarchy section we just skipped over. Um, this, Plug it up for in case. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> um, I'm going to think about that some more too. Um, uh, yeah. It's something we we only recently sort of really delved into more. I also like this idea of having this kind of random code that's repeated as a way of kind of holding on to memories uh, for a period of time. Um, you know, I don't know that we have to resort necessarily to hippocampal code, but just the idea that there is a consistent random code that mm -hmm. can be used to tie together. Uh, things and extend the, I think that's a really nice idea. Yeah. yeah. And I yeah. think one thing that excites me about that or my, my intuition or something that might be interesting, I'll make it less strong a statement, is we know that it seems to be the case that the hippocampus is somehow relevant for short-term memory. And over time, the neocortex takes over from the hippocampus. So we, we have this fuzzy idea that something like that happens. Perhaps it's the case that this, this replay is what the hippocampus does to enable something to be stable for a short period of time. But as the neocortex learns through mechanisms you folks have described, that becomes less relevant. And perhaps there's some mechanic going on. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, yeah. You know, it used to be thought, first, it's a very well documented thing that, you know, for obviously it's not a hippocampus, HM, the patient HM yep. can't learn new things really, basically much. And, um, it used to be thought that the, the hippocampus would transfer its memory to the neocortex. And I never believed that. Didn't totally. Yeah, it makes no sense. The brain. Yeah, exactly. Not many people would agree with that. <laughs> but, but there has been studies, I think what I was going to ask me because I can remember, never remember anything. But uh, there was a very, very clear study that showed that that's not the case, that, the, that it's not a transfer. It's that the cortex learns and the hippocampus learns. But the, the, the cortex will not finish its learning if the hippocampus is not there. Right. which is consistent with what I think you just said, um, which makes a lot more sense to me. So they, again, even if we wanted to, let's say, model something in a, in, a, uh, in a machine, we don't necessarily have to model the entire hippocampal function. We just have to say, oh, here's a guiding signal to tell you yep. to keep learning or something like that. Totally. Um, yeah, so I agree with that comment. Um, um, you know, there's, it, the way I kind of view it is, um, is that the hippocampus is this sort of highly evolved system that was sort of grew organically over eons of evolution where you know you're learning to navigate in an environment then you're doing episodic memories and all this kind of stuff and then 
what happened was the, the, the basic processes that, it, that are functioning in the hippocampal complex, which would be the enteronocortex, the subiculum, and hippocampus, that those basic processes got uh, put into a cleaner, smaller, unique form that became the cortical column. Hmm. And so it's like a, it's like a, it's the, you know, a complex overgrown bag of tricks. Hippocampus becomes this known other, more a svelte, uh, simple version of it that gets repeated. Um, so we would see a lot of the same things going on. That's why we think of the grid cells and play cell equivalents in the, in the cortex. Um, but uh, we don't have to copy all that um, messiness to understand the cortex. Got it. One way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Max. Uh, I know we've taken yeah. up a lot of your time. And yeah. I should say, you know, you know, you said you're in inspired by us, but you're inspiring as well. Just the fact that, you know, you're able to do, you know, uh, you're able to run a company and then on the somehow on the side as a passion project, do such a detailed neuroscience model uh, is, is really inspiring. As well. It is inspiring. And it makes me feel like a laggard because when I was running a company, I couldn't do that. I didn't do that. I, I could, my weekends was like, I just have to like, you know, decompress or something. So, uh, anyway, so you have to be able to do this while you're running a business. It's pretty damn impressive. Um, yeah, anyway, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, I'll, uh, yeah, okay. Are we done? Are we going to stop?